To find out more about the series, please visit our website at virgilkaylock.uk. The Strange Tales of Virgil Kaylock. Waterhall. Chapter 3 We appreciate your misgivings, Mr. Weston, but we are decided. We'll spend the night at Waterhall. To our great surprise, Miss Blythe had been receptive to our enterprise and eager to help. She had insisted that we move our belongings to the school for the sake of convenience. Our landlord was not convinced. It's pure folly. She's as mad as a March hare. You forgot to mention that Miss Blythe lives there, Mr Weston. Well, I didn't know the daft old bat was still alive. Thought she died off years ago. Oh, she seemed quite bright. More lonely than mad, I should say. I'd not stay one night in Stokeswood, not one. Sick of place. We know about Kitty Cooper and Martha Gray and the terrible tragedy that occurred there. Then why in God's name would you want to go anywhere near the place? Mr Weston, will you take us and our belongings back to Stokeswood? I will not. Mr Weston loaded our belongings onto the cart, and that afternoon we returned to Waterhall. You're as mad as she is. As before, Mr Weston deposited us and our effects at the padlocked gate. Thank you, Mr Weston. We can manage from here. Don't forget your camera. Thanks so much for all your help. It is much appreciated. It was apparent that Miss Blythe rarely, if ever, received visitors and had been starved of company. She clearly needed to talk, and there was no shortage of tea and ginger cake. Oh, no more, really. Thank you. You've been so kind. Well, I hope you will be comfortable here. I have made up your beds in the dormitories, and I've laid out plenty of spare blankets should you be cold. There's no shortage of sheets and blankets. (laughs) The daylight was fading, and Miss Blythe held a candle to light our way as we ascended the staircase to the third floor. The vandalism that had corrupted the school was less evident the higher we climbed. The furniture was more or less intact, and the walls untouched. It may surprise you to learn that the roof is quite sound, and we have no leaks that I'm aware of. Excellent. I've left you plenty of candles. It'll soon be dark, and you will certainly need them. That's most considerate. Thank you. Nonsense! It's a pleasure to have some children here after all this time. It brings the school to life. Now, I have put Dorothy in here. The dormitory room was large, cold and drafty, with peeling paper and a plain wooden floor. It was empty, save for the twenty wireframe beds which stood in two lines against opposite walls. A single bed had been made up in the middle of a row. Though old and yellowing, the sheets and blankets seemed clean and dry and were folded tight to the bed in the military style. And, Mr. Kaylock, I've put you in the room across the hall. Now, what else do you need? Nothing at all, thank you. You've been most kind. Thank you. Then I will leave you. Come down when you are rested, and we'll begin. Miss Blythe, we thought we might take a look in Hades. Would you allow us to set up the wireless there? In Hades? With your permission, of course. Well, you won't find anything down there, It sounds alarming, doesn't it? But Hades is just a fanciful name for a very dull cellar. When Kitty spoke, she told us she was in Hades. I don't see how that's possible. It would be a good place to start. Uh, Would you mind? But there's nothing there. All the same. It's not been opened for many years, you know. I keep it locked. I don't know why. Habit, I suppose. Look, we're not sure if this will work at all. It's uh, It's an experiment. Let's be constructive, shall we? I believe it will. After all, Water Hall is full of ghosts. Really? Oh, yes. When I sleep, I can believe that I hear them, all chatting together naughty things, and creeping around the corridors looking for Tuck in the kitchen. Off to bed with you! Shoo! Have you ever seen Kitty? Or Martha? That's the thing with ghosts, isn't it? You never really see them, do you? You just know that they're there, somehow. You're not afraid? Of ghosts. No, of course not. Ghosts can't hurt you. Only the living can do that. And what about old Nick? No, really. He's nothing more than a silly story to frighten naughty little girls. Rest now, and then we'll all go down to Hades together, shall we? Wait until midnight. 
That's the time for ghosts, I believe. I'll be waiting for you downstairs. Dorothy unpacked the few belongings that she had brought over from the green man and placed them on the adjacent bed. Astonishing. You mentioned ghosts and she doesn't bat an eyelid. Do you know, I'm actually quite tired. I might have a nap. You can sleep. Here. (laughs) Don't worry. I'm not getting into those sheets, but I will have a lie down. I'll stay with you. No, you won't. Go to your own dorm. Very well. You'll be all right. Well, if I'm not, you'll know about it. See you later. Get some rest. It'll be my first night spent in a girl's dormitory. (laughs) Lucky you. See you shortly. My room was a mirror image of Dorothy's. My bed was in the middle of a row and had been laid out with the same precision. I lit a candle and lay back, my coat serving as a blanket. As the candle flame flickered, the shadows danced and the room seemed to sway and move like a ship at sea. In a very short time, I had fallen into a deep sleep. I scrambled to my feet. The candle had gone out, and I stumbled about in total darkness. I found the door and burst into the dormitory across the hall. What is it? Oh, my God. What happened? Why did you scream? Are you all right? Did you hear it? What? Hear what? Did you want some water? I I was asleep. Um, I was so tired, I fell asleep, I think, and then I heard crying. A girl was kneeling on my bed just here. She was crying, weeping, long, dark hair. It was Kitty, I think. She had long, dark hair. She took my hand, led me by the hand to the door. She she wanted me to listen. It was faint. It was like the sound of someone opening and closing a pair of scissors. Like faint, but coming closer, closer, until it was right outside the door. There was a scream and, and a panic. The girls, all of the girls, were waking up from their beds, shouting and running and fighting to get away from the sound. It, it was all thick, all thick, and his scissors... He was coming for us. You had a dream. No, I woke up and and then... What? And then I saw him. What? It was dark, but I saw him. He was here. What did you see exactly? I saw a little man. A wizened old man leaving the room, closing the door. I saw the scissors in his hand. He was here. I saw his thin, white hand holding the scissors. You dreamt it. It wasn't a dream. I didn't see anything. I'll take a look, all right? Stay there. There's nothing. I can't see anything. Perhaps what you saw... Forget it. There's nothing there. I said forget it. It was a nightmare. I can take a look around. Don't bother. What time is it? I raised my pocket watch to the candle. I can hardly believe it. It's midnight. We've been asleep for hours. Come on. Bring the wireless. Are you sure? Absolutely. Let's get going. I collected the candles and the parcel and followed Dorothy down the wide staircase the candlelight throwing long shadows which crouched and leapt around us. We should let Miss Blythe know, don't you think? The door to Miss Blythe's rooms was closed. All was quiet. Miss Blythe? Hello? Miss Blythe? Are you there? The kitchen was in darkness. The cups and saucers and cake had not been cleared away, but lay on the table where we had left them. The cat, which had been sleeping, stood up from its cushion, hissed, and ran off through a door at the back of the room. Miss Blythe? She's asleep. Hello? It's late. Let's not wake her. Very well. We'll find Hades on our own. It's this way, I think. We walked through the empty corridors in silence. It was so dark that the candlelight could only penetrate a small way ahead, and our shadows followed furtively behind us, like flickering giants. This is just horrible. I hate it. We could leave. Call it a day. We could go back to the Green Man. And how would we get there? I wouldn't want to be lost in Stokes Wood in the middle of the night either. Dorothy gripped my arm. Wait. What what was that? What? Did you hear it? I heard something. Miss Blythe? Is that you? Hello? Probably the cat. It's an old house. Come on, it's around here somewhere. We entered classroom 7B and made our way through the tidy rows of desks to the little black door at the back. It was unlocked and had swung open, framing the darkness beyond. Darkness and the smell of earth. Dorothy thrust the candle through the doorway. A flight of wooden stairs led down and disappeared into the shadows. I'll go first. 
Give me the wireless. I'll pass it down to you. Once down the steps, we lit half a dozen candles to illuminate the space and banish the shadows to the corners and recesses. It was a square room, about twenty feet across. The ceiling was low, but I was able to stand. It may have been painted, but it was impossible to know what colour it had once been. One side of the room was lined with heavy shelves, laden with a jumbled miscellany of objects, dusty jars and bottles, boxes of tools and trays of old cutlery, light fittings and doorstops, and all the disordered clutter that gets forgotten in places such as this. It's cold. All basements are much alike in that respect. Miss Blythe was right. It's just an old cellar. It's still not a nice place to leave a child alone, is it? Times have changed, thank God. What? It's nothing. It feels so sad. It's filthy. Right, give me a minute. I moved a jumble of music stands to reach a dusty table. I unpacked the wireless from its paper and string, connected the batteries, and turned it on. The valves began to glow, and the familiar hum filled the room. Miss Blythe will be disappointed. She wanted to see it. She wouldn't be able to get down those steps. She was just being polite. There. That's it. Ready. Say something. No. You go ahead. Really? Go on. Right. Um, here goes. Uh, Kitty, this is Virgil. I'm here at Waterhall. We are in Hades. We've come to find you. Hello, Catherine. Catherine Cooper. I don't know a great deal about you, but I know you are tall and clever, and that you have long black hair, and you have a friend called Martha. Something happened here a long time ago, something dreadful. You reached out to us. Why, I don't know, but I think you want to be found, don't you? You are alone and you are frightened, and I would like to help you if I can. Nothing. Try again. My name is Virgil, and this is Dorothy. Hello? We continued for well over an hour, coaxing and pleading the shadows to speak back to us. But there was no reply. What are we doing? This is pointless. Even if she did speak to us again, there's precious little we can do for her. She's been alone and terrified for more than 20 years. We can try a while longer. Anyway, I'm not going back to that dormitory. Look... We made a mistake. I made a mistake. Perhaps we've read too much into this. There's nothing here. Shh. Oh my gosh, listen. Kitty? Kitty, darling. We've come to find you. Would you like that? Martha ran away, didn't she? Are you hiding? You've been hiding for such a long time. Where are you, Kitty? I think you helped Martha escape, didn't you? You found the key and let her out, is that right? But something scared you. You hid and Martha ran away. Is that what happened? Why are you hiding, darling? Why is Martha running? What is she scared of? What did she say? Under the shelves? Where? We got onto our hands and knees and pulled at the sacks, boxes and jars on the lowest shelf. Wait, I can see something. Pass me a candle. Behind a crate of empty jars and bottles, there was a scattered pile of fallen plaster and broken wooden laths. What can you see? There's a hole. It's a small... just over a foot across. Is she there? I don't know. Maybe. Kitty? Are you hiding in the wall? I can't, I can't see. Can you pull the shelves out of it? The shelves spanned the entire length of the room. They were excessively laden and prodigiously heavy, and though I pulled with all my strength, they would not move. Clear the shelves. Wait. If I can just lever them away... I seized an iron curtain pole, and wedging it behind the heavy wooden shelves, I pulled as hard as I could. Here, let me help. As we laboured, a gap of about an inch appeared, and slowly, slowly, the shelves began to move. Nearly there! 
The room exploded in a riot of splintered wood, broken glass, tins and crockery, and we were left drowning in a sea of choking dust. The collapse had blown out the candles, and the cellar was as black as pitch. Dorothy! Are you all right? Uh, I'm fine. Are you? Oh, my God. Look. The fallen shelves had pulled away a large section of plaster from the wall, and there, in a narrow hollow, covered in dust and rubble, was the withered body of a child. Pass me that candle. She was standing upright, held tightly between the joists where she had crawled in to hide some twenty years before. Her hair was lustrous, thick and long, and flowed down over her shoulders. But time had desiccated her body and shrunk her skin, until she was little more than bones. You're safe now, Kitty. We found you. Her eyes were empty sockets, and her jaw hung open in a silent howl of loneliness and terror. Kitty, you're safe. Kitty said nothing at all. The wireless had fallen silent under the havoc of wreckage and rubble. God bless you, Kitty Cooper. Miss Blythe? Hello? We're down here. Is that you, Miss Blythe? We found her. We found Kitty. Hello? Miss Blythe? Hello? We found her. She crawled inside the wall. She died down here, poor girl. Best place for her. Only the naughtiest girls go to hell. What are you doing? I ran up the steps, but the door would not open. We had been locked in. Miss Blythe, open this door. I only opened the door for the nice children. But you've not been nice, have you? You've been wicked. Miss Blythe, open this door. I only opened the door for the nice children. What are you talking about? Open the door. You break into my house. You trespass and defile my school. You lie to me. And where do we put the nasty little lights? Where? We put them in old Nick's cellar. Open this door, now! Wickedness will be punished! Let us out! How dare you! Speak on your spoken to, young lady. It will not be tolerated. Waterhall is a good school, a respectable school. You're mad. There is no school. Let us out! But, good heavens, who is this? We have a visitor. There's someone come to see. Here comes old Nick with his scissors. Snicker, snick. She's insane. Snicker, snick. Let us snicker, out of here. You scissors. are old Nick. Snicker, snick. You killed Martha Gray. Stokes Ward is out of bounds. You murdered her. And what will become of the children in the cellar? The little liars in the cellar. Damn you. Let us out. Wash them, brush them, scrub them clean. Oh, what's that smell? A thin liquid trickled under the door and dripped down onto the wooden steps. My God, it's paraffin. What the hell are you doing? Thou shalt go down into Hades in anguish and in flames. She's burning us alive. This is madness. The guilty shall pass through the fire and their wickedness will be We've got to get out of here. Get us out of here. It won't budge. Break it down. I'm trying. I can't. Let me. Stop. It's useless. Christ! She's insane. We have to get out. There's no windows. We're going to die in here. The cold subterranean air mingled with the acrid smell of paraffin and smoke. I stamped out the flames at my feet, but though I pounded and kicked at the door, it did not move. Help! Let us out! Help! I'm so sorry, Dorothy. Help! Help! It's no good. No one can hear us. I'm so sorry for everything. I love you. Kitty Cooper had a key. What? Kitty Cooper had the key. She opened the door to free Martha Gray. Kitty Cooper's hands were held to her chest. Her fingers were clenched tightly into a fist and so withered that they resembled the claw of a bird. The brittle little bones cracked and crumbled as I prized them apart and the key fell to the ground. Come on! 
an intense heat. The classroom was ablaze. The desks and chairs, books and paper were engulfed in flames. The noxious fumes stung our eyes and burned in our throats. She's burning the building. She's burning it all down. Take my hand. The corridor was thick with smoke and flame. Tongues of fire stretched out across the floor and up the walls. I can't see. Don't breathe the smoke. Stay low. This way. Take my hand. We need air. Nigga, snake. Where is she? Come on, this way. Where do you think you're going, young lady? Through the seething smoke, a figure <laughs> took shape before us. A goblin, a devil, contorted with rage and brandishing a large pair of scissors. Stay back! Who let you out? Kitty. Kitty Cooper let us out. Well, we'll see what old Nick says about that, Martha Gray. Snigger snake. Get away from me. Ah! Ah! I felt the blow as she lunged and passed me. The scissors flashing in her hand. Snigger snake. Snigger and then snigger. she disappeared into the enveloping smoke. Your arm. A dark stain was spreading across my arm and dripping to the floor. Here comes old Nick with his scissors. Snigger snake. This way. Quick. Where is she? Who cares? Virgil, come on. You can't hide from me. Run. Snigger snake. Snigger snake. Snigger snake. Snigger snake. Snigger snake. Snigger snake. We burst out of the building into the cold night air and collapsed, coughing onto the grass. Water Hall was an inferno. The fire had taken hold and was rampaging through the building, forcing dense black smoke to erupt from the windows. Stokes wood twisted and danced in the hellish glare and echoed with the sounds of collapsing timbers and exploding glass. Look! Miss Blythe stood at a large broken window on the first floor, washed in the black smoke which billowed around her and up into the night sky. She was quite still. Her body was straight and her arms relaxed at her sides. She tilted her head as if seeing us for the first time. The scissors dropped from her hand and then she stepped back into the smoke and out of sight. I never again heard the voice of Kitty Cooper, and I do not know if, by our actions, we were able to bring her the peace that she so desperately craved. I do not know if she is free from fear or in eternal terror of the devil that holds her captive. I no longer listen to the wireless. A wireless is a door, a door to who knows where. But in these modern times, such things are hard to avoid. Shortly after these events, I was walking in London when I heard music playing. It was a familiar tune and popular at the time. The wireless had been placed on a table outside the shop to attract passers-by. Waterhall, Chapter 3, by John Ram, Virgil Kaylock was played by Nicholas Bolton. The young Kaylock, Daniel Fraser. Dorothy Bell, Ellie Turner. Miss Blythe, Maggie Olerenshaw. And Kitty Cooper was played by Jennifer English. The music was composed and performed by Neil Brand. The Strange Tales of Virgil Kaylock are produced by Richard Varman, Martin Malone and John Ram and are supported using lottery funding by the National Lottery through Arts Council England. It is a Kaylock production. To find out more about the series, please visit our website at virgilkaylock.com.
www.thepodcastmaker.co.uk